That Well, good evening, guys. I am so glad that you chose to come here tonight. Today is a good day, isn't it? Not just because my football team won either. It's good because Jesus wins, right? He has won. And so that is the ultimate good news. Hey, just a couple reminders. Make sure each night when you come, you bring that little scan tag with you, and we will make sure that you are scanned in. Um, when you leave tonight, you're going to get a little book. We'll do one per household just to make sure we have enough. But if we have extra, then you're welcome to go ahead and, and grab one, or if you want more than one. Um, and then, of course, make sure each night you come and you grab your lesson guide. And the best way, if you really want to get the most out of uh, this seminar, the best thing to do is, is to try to come to every night. I know life gets busy and you're about to leave the house and, and your aunt who, who can talk your ear off gives you a call or, or you realize you, you got, need to get gas or, you know, life gets busy. But, but I tell you, if you can come to as many of these and as you come, if you can fill in the answers as we go through and look up the, the verses, you can even go home later that night and just to double check, look up the Bible verses, review it, and just come with a humble, teachable attitude. And I tell you, friends, God will absolutely bless you. Now, tomorrow at 6 p.m., this is, this is a big presentation. We're going to talk about Revelation's Lake of Fire. What is hell fire? How hot is it, right? Who's in charge? Where is it at? You know, not only how hot it is, but I'm going to give you like the five-day forecast for hell. I'm going to tell you what the weather is like in hell. Can you imagine that? And so we're going to find out some pretty cool things tomorrow night on this very hot subject. And then next Friday, and so we're off Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and and, but just because we're off, I want to encourage you guys to come back on Friday night because Friday night we're going to look at Revelation chapter 20 and there's a beautiful timeline. You see last night's presentation on the second coming of Jesus and then tonight and tomorrow and Friday, these four really build upon each other. And so next Friday night, we're going to have an incredible timeline of events that take place in the last days. And then next Saturday night will be our final double header. And, and the first presentation is the lie that's destroying America. And then Revelation's eternal sign. And then a week from tonight, buried and forgotten by God. And so you can see we've got some really big subjects coming up. I want to add, uh, I want to start off by adding just a real quick caveat before I get into tonight's presentation. Uh, tonight's presentation is one of the most important presentations. I mean, I think they're all important, but, but, but tonight is extremely important for a couple of reasons. One, we learned last night that one of the ways Satan is going to attack in the last days is he is going to do miracles, false miracles miracles and yes the devil can perform miracles and often his miracles are patterned after God's true miracles and so the devil can do miracles and what we're going to learn tonight not only is going to reveal what I believe the Bible teaches will be the greatest deception the devil's going to use in the last days but I believe tonight's message is, is one of hope and encouragement and what it's going to do is it's the bible is going to show us how god wants to protect his believers in the last days now the caveat i really want to add though is tonight is also going to be for some it might be a, a little bit sensitive and you'll see what i mean as we get into tonight's presentation it might be a little bit sensitive to some and so i just want to humbly ask you to just kind of hear it out see what the bible has to say and, and, and take the evidence from God's word. So, so tonight you are going to be asked, the Bible is going to challenge some of you a little bit, and it's going to ask you to kind of look at things a little bit different. And so if there was ever a night that you might learn something new, tonight might be that night. But I humbly ask you to please just examine the evidence in the Bible and say, okay, does this make sense? Does it harmonize with the Bible? Is Jesus uplifted? And if it's yes, yes, and yes, then I would encourage you tonight to believe what the Bible has to say. Now, with that said, let me have just a quick prayer and we'll open up the Bible and we'll get started. Father in heaven, again, we just want to thank you and we want to praise you for today, Lord. Today is a good day. 
And the reason it's a good day is because we serve a risen Savior and you love us and you are in control, not just of this world, but you're in control of our lives. And so, Father, I pray right now that you would take charge of this meeting and that you would speak through your word and the Holy Spirit to each and every one of us here tonight. And we ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, our subjects entitled, Prophecy Reveals Satan's Final Deceit. Now, King Saul was the first king to rule over the nation of Israel. Not to get confused with the Saul in the New Testament who became the Apostle Paul. But King Saul was the first king to rule over the nation of Israel. And the Bible tells us that when the Philistine army came to attack the weaker army of Israel, King Saul went to the priests and the prophets to find out some counsel from the Lord. He wanted to know how is the battle going to go the next day. Except the problem is, God would not speak to King Saul. So King Saul decided he had to resort to a different method to find out how the battle the next day against the Philistines would be played out. The Bible says that Saul disguised himself and he went to the witch of Endor. We read here in 1 Samuel, Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. Even though God clearly forbade his people from talking with spiritual mediums or those who, you know, necromancers, those who claim to speak or communicate with the dead, King Saul was so desperate because he wanted to know how the battle the next day against the Philistine army would play out. And of course, this witch went through her hocus pocus and she said, you know, bring me up Samuel. And all of a sudden, this apparition comes up claiming to be Samuel the prophet. And this apparition gives the king an utterly hopeless message. Now, I want you to notice what the Bible has to say. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 28, And Saul perceived that it was Samuel the prophet. When the Bible says that Saul perceived that it was Samuel the prophet, that word perceived means he only what? He only thought. What he had seen or what he had heard, whatever that was, he perceived, he thought that it was Samuel the prophet. Now, the Bible tells us in, in the previous verses that this witch of Endor, she actually saw God's ascending up out of the earth. And then again, she gives the king an utterly hopeless message. Basically, the message the king was told was this. Hey, don't worry about the battle tomorrow. Because you and your sons are going to die in battle, and that's exactly what happened. But don't worry, because you're going to end up in the same place as me. Now, let's think about this for a moment. I know God is the ultimate judge, and we learned last night that he's committed all judgment over to his son. But is King Saul, who had an entire village of priests murdered, who had grieved the Holy Spirit to the point where God wouldn't even speak to him, who tried to kill David on multiple occasions, who the next day in battle would fall on his own sword in a, in a hopeless state, is he going to, is King Saul going to end up in the same place as godly Samuel the prophet? I don't think he is, friends. I highly doubt that. And so looking here at question number one, in your lesson guide, remember anytime there's a, a cue, and there's a number that corresponds with the lesson guide. Did Saul actually see Samuel the prophet? The answer is no. He only perceived. And if not, what did he see? He most likely saw a demon in disguise or perhaps even the devil himself. And so Saul did not actually see Samuel the prophet. He saw what he thought was Samuel, but it in fact was a demon in disguise. You know, John tells us in the book of Revelation, he says, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. By thy sorceries. In the last days, the devil's going to do miracles we learned last night that he can do miracles, that he is going to deceive. And Revelation tells us the way he is going to deceive is by his what? 
sorceries. Keep that in mind because that's a very important point. And so notice here question number two. It says all spiritualism, both ancient and modern, can be rooted in two essential foundational tenets. List them. Now, there's basically two main beliefs when it comes to spiritualism or spiritism. And, and here's what they are. Number one, under certain conditions, the dead can communicate with the living. So number one is under certain conditions, the dead can communicate with the living. This is spiritualism. And the second one is under certain conditions, the living can communicate with the dead. So the dead can talk with the living and the living can communicate with the dead. Those are two main beliefs when it comes to spiritism or spiritualism. In fact, when you think about the books that reach the New York Times bestseller list every year, many of them have to do with uh, this idea of can we communicate with those who have died? Can we talk to those who have gone on before? And again, these are very popular books because people want to know what happens. Where do you go? Can we communicate? You know, what's interesting is you could go out today and you could visit pretty much, well, let's just say you decided to walk down downtown Albany or downtown Tangent or wherever you live. You could stop and ask 10 different people the same question what happens when you die? And you would get like 11 different answers. You could even ask 10 different people within the same church denomination and you may get 11 different answers. You know, when I was 18 years old, I lost my grandfather. I was very, very close with my grandfather. And uh, I was 18. I was a senior in high school. And I remember he died of a heart attack. We went to his house. The paramedics were there. And, and it was the first time I'd ever lost somebody that was so close to me that, that I actually grieved. I cried. Now, I was sad when I, you know, had a distant aunt or a real, but, but my grandfather, you know, we fished together, we played golf together and, 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 and just, just a very godly man. He was a, he was a four square minister, very godly man. And, and, and he would read the Bible with me. And, and, and even though I was a rebellious 18 year old, um, he cared about me. And I remember I was at his funeral there in Southern California where we lived. And at his funeral, we were in this little church and the church was packed and the minister was giving the sermon. And in that sermon, my grandfather, the, he, I mean, he was buried. He had a casket and he was laying there in his casket. And the minister began to talk about my grandpa. And he began to describe what my grandfather was experiencing right then. He said, you know, grandpa. He's up there walking the streets of gold and probably sees, you know, the tree of life. And he's probably high-fiving, you know, St. Peter and, and his guardian angel. And he sees his mansion. And he painted this incredible picture of what my grandfather was experiencing. And then a couple of hours later, we went to the graveside service. And if you've been to one, you know what I'm talking about. That's where they, 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 they lower the casket down and the, fa the family takes some dirt and we begin to, you know, uh, uh, cover the casket. And that same preacher who at the church painted this incredible image of what my grandfather was experiencing now had this to say. And he said, and I quote, one of these days, Jesus is going to come back. And your grandfather is going to burst up out of that grave and grandpa is going to meet Jesus in the air. And I leaned over to, I think it was my mom at the time, and I said, Mom, I am really confused. Am I the only one who caught this? I thought, I am confused. I said, where's grandpa? I said, that preacher at the church said grandpa was walking the streets of gold. But now that preacher says grandpa is in this box awaiting the resurrection and grandpa's going to come up out of the grave when Jesus comes back. Is grandpa there? Is he there? Where's grandpa? And the answer I got was interesting. The answer I got was basically, well, part of grandpa is up there and part of grandpa is, is there. And, and when Jesus comes back, these two parts of grandpa are going to come back together and grandpa's going to be whole again. Now, when you're 18 years old and you don't really care much about church because mom and dad make you go, but you know, you just can't wait for church to be over. Or you hope they have free donuts at church that week, right? Or, you know, your, your priorities elsewhere. You know, there was a lot of confusion in my mind. 
And I realized even today when it comes to the subject of death, there is a lot of confusion. I heard the story of, of a young man that was walking through a church cemetery and he, and he saw this headstone and he read it. And the headstone said, remember me as you walk by, as you are now, so once was I. Did I read that right? Let me start over. Remember me as you walk by, as you are now, as you are now, so once was I. I read that right. As I am now, soon you will be. So prepare yourself to follow me. I kind of butchered that one a little bit. <laughs> it kind of threw me off the way it was written. Remember me as you walk by, as you were now, so once was I, as I am now, soon you will be. So prepare yourself to follow me. Well, the young man didn't really appreciate what was written. So he pulled out a, a crayon and he wrote on that tombstone to follow you. I'm not content until I know just where you went. Right. <laughs> and so a little, little humor there. Um, I want you to notice question number three in your lesson guide. Question three says, The first lie recorded in the Bible was told by the father of lies himself, Satan. In Genesis 3, 4, what words does Satan whisper to Eve? Before we look at Genesis 3, 4, let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. God told Adam and Eve after he made the garden, God said to Adam and Eve, You can eat from any tree you want to, except from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because if you eat from that tree, God said to Adam and Eve, if you eat from that tree, you are going to what? Die. We talked about that last night. If you eat from that tree, you're going to die. Well, the devil has the conversation with Eve and the devil says to Eve and the serpent said unto her, unto the woman, you shall not surely die. So the answer to question number three is the very first lie recorded spoken of by the enemy of souls himself is you shall not die die. God said, if you eat of the tree, you're going to die. The devil comes along and he says, you're not really going to die. So think about that. The very first lie, what Satan used to deceive Adam and Eve deals with this idea of, do you really die? You know, there was a spiritualist who commented on this passage, and his name is E.W. Sprague, and here's what he had to say. He said, in this, as in many other Bible passages, the devil told the truth, and the Lord is in error. So let me ask you, who are you going to believe tonight? Are you going to believe God, or are you going to believe the snake in the tree? It is very important we understand this subject. If what I'm presenting tonight, if we do not understand it, friends, and we are here right before the coming of Christ, we will be deceived. I cannot emphasize that enough. You see, the devil's crafty, but he rarely reinvents the wheel. All right? He uses, if it works, he keeps using the same tactics. And the very thing he used to deceive Eve, this idea of you're not really going to die, in the last days, he's going to use that very same deception, but it is going to be global. And so to really understand then where we go or where we go when we die, we have to understand where is it that we have come from? Where do we come from in the beginning? Well, question number four says, according to Genesis 2, 7, God formed man of two elements. What were they? Well, the Bible says, question number four, Genesis 2, 7, and the Lord God formed man of the, now here's the first part you want to write in there, dust of the ground. So the two elements, element number one is dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the, and here's the second one is the breath of life. Dust of the ground, breath of life. So think about this. When God created Adam, the Bible says that God formed Adam from the dust of the ground. So I want you to picture kind of in your mind's eye, in your imagination, picture Adam. He's laid out on the ground. All right. He's not alive, but his body is there. And everything is in place. His, his organs are in place. His, his bones, his blood, his brain, his, his skin, his hair. Everything is in place, but Adam is not alive. He was formed from the dust of the ground. And everything's in place, but he's not alive. But then God leans over Adam and he breathes into his nostrils. He goes... Breathes into Adam's nostrils, and all of a sudden, Adam's heart did what? It began to beat. Boom, 
Boom. And as it began to beat, it began to push blood, which began to carry oxygen. And it went to his brain. And then Adam probably went, and he took that first breath. And he probably sat up, looked around. <laughs> I would have loved to know how that first conversation went, right? <laughs> I mean, imagine Adam, he, he's there, he opens his eyes, and he probably looked up and he sees his creator right there. And he, I don't know, maybe he said, who are you, <laughs> right? And, who am I? What is all this, right? I mean, I, I assume he had the ability to, to speak and, and think. And, and imagine what that first conversation, as God began to explain to Adam exactly who he was. And the purpose, why he was created. So there's two elements, the body plus the breath. And then the Bible says, it continues in Genesis 2, 7, the Bible says, and man became a living soul. So notice question number five. After these two elements converged, and what were the elements? The body plus the breath. They came together. Then what? And the answer to number five is man became a living soul. Now that's how the King James puts it. Um, the New King James, or at least some of the more modern translations, they don't use the phrase a living soul. They say he became a living being. All right. But I, I, I like that phrase, a living soul, because if we're going to understand this idea of death, which is a great mystery, we need to I, understand what is a soul? What is a soul? You see, the word soul and even the word spirit are often used interchangeably. And you may not realize this, but what has happened over the centuries is, is people have used popular culture, well, I guess I could say over the decades, because not necessarily over the centuries, but over the last few decades, what happens with a lot of people is they have allowed Hollywood movies and TV shows and even cartoons to teach their theology on what happens upon death. You see, even though I went to a number of different churches as a kid, when I was like 13 or 14 years old, me and my best friend at the time, Nick, we went and saw a movie called Ghost. It starred the late Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore. And, and if, you know, I'm not endorsing that movie, but if you've seen that movie, you know what I'm talking about. In that movie, Patrick Swayze dies because he's trying to protect his the love of his life from um, a robber, and, and, and he doesn't realize at first that he died until he actually looks back. What happened is, there's like this apparition that looks like Patrick Swayze, or at least the character he played, that actually steps out of his body. And you see a lot of this in Hollywood movies, and horror films, even in many of the Disney cartoons and movies. I want you to, if you've got kids or grandkids, or if you just watch entertainment in general, I want you to start noticing how many of the TV shows, whether they're cartoons to movies, all deal with the same idea of the living talking to the dead and the dead communicating with the living. You see it in virtually every of the Disney, even the princess movies. It's amazing how much of that. You know, I watched a few years ago, I watched the movie Moana, the Disney movie Moana with, with, with my kids. And, and interesting enough, right there in Moana, you've got spiritualism. You've got the dead coming back, you know, to communicate with the living. I tell you, friends, the devil is setting the stage and he is doing an incredible job not to give him too much credit. So we need to understand this idea of soul and spirit. You see, the idea of a soul is this. Nowhere does the Bible teach, now don't want to miss this, nowhere does the Bible teach that man was given a soul. In fact, I think this is part of question number five. It says, notice, this is number five, notice that it, it, notice that it says he became, not that he had or was given a soul soul. It says man became a soul. So you do not possess a soul that pops out of you upon death. That's in the Hollywood movies. That's not in the Bible, beloved. If you, if you want to go by the Bible, the Bible teaches man became a living soul. So if you want to see a soul, all you have to do is look to your left, look to your right, look up here. You are a living soul. 
All right? We do not possess a soul, but rather you are a living soul. That's very important to understand. And so let's do some math here. Let's keep going here. Notice, if you've got a body, that's what Adam had, a body, and then God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, body plus breath, man became a what? A living soul. Now watch Adam's face. You're looking at Adam's face. This is funny. Body plus breath equals living soul. Now watch Adam's face. Uh Uh-oh. He knows what's coming, right? (laughs) Did, did, Did you see that? He knows. He knows what this preacher's about to do. If you've got a living person and they stop breathing, what happens? They become a corpse. So question number six. Notice carefully, death is simply creation in reverse. All right. We need to establish that fact. When a person dies, what happens is it is creation in reverse. Now what happened at creation? You had a body plus the breath, that breath of God equals a living soul. But when a person dies, what you're going to see here is when a person dies, it is now the exact opposite of creation. Meaning when a person dies, the body which was made of dust, is going to return back to what? Dust, right? Now, some people wonder, well, you know, should I be buried? Should I be cremated? And, you know, most people in the Bible were buried. There's no biblical reference to be either one. I'm, for a financial reason, I'm choosing to be cremated. But when you think about it, all cremation does is speed up the process. You understand that, right? That's all it does. It just speeds up the process and Don't quote me on this, but I think it probably is a little bit more uh, affordable as well. But don't quote me because I could be wrong. So death is simply creation in reverse. And so notice question number seven. What is the spirit that returns to God upon death? So notice, oh, you know what? Before I go there, let's read out number six. I, I like the illustration I put in here about the box. So the body, this is number six. Notice carefully, death is simply creation in reverse. The body minus the breath of God results in death. Like a box that is constructed of nails and boards, when the nails are removed, the box simply ceases to what? It does not go to box heaven. All right? Now, this is going to make more sense here when we look at the next verse. So question seven, what is the spirit that returns to God who gave it? So question seven, Ecclesiastes 12, seven, then shall the dust, that's the body, returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit, which we're going to find out now, that spirit is simply the breath of life, that spirit returns to God who gave it. So remember, death is the exact opposite of creation. At creation, you have a dust becomes a body. Then you've got breath breathed into that body. You've got a life. When a person dies, they quit breathing. That breath leaves their body and goes back to God. And that breath that leaves their body is the spirit of God. Not to be confused with the Holy Spirit, all right? Don't let that confuse you there. Because the word spirit in the Bible, well, in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, the word spirit is the word ruach. And it's often used as wind, air, breath, or even spirit. So again, that spirit that leaves the body when a person dies and goes back to God, that spirit is not the conscious part of a person. That is simply the breath of life going back to God. Let me illustrate this for you. In Job chapter 27, I'm going to show, show, you the, show you the same verse in two different Bible translations, all right? So notice Job 27, this is the, uh, the King James. It says, all the while the breath is in me and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. Job says the spirit of God is in his nostrils. Now, if we take the position that the spirit is a ghost, then that means Job's got a ghost up his nose, right? (laughs) Well, I certainly hope not. Same verse. Now, notice how the NIV translates it. I like the NIV translation better on this one. The NIV, same verse, as long as I have life within me, the breath of God is in my nostrils. You see, the King James Bible says the spirit of God 
but the NIV says the breath of God. The reason is, is that breath that leaves the body is simply the spirit of God, meaning the breath of life. And so when a person dies, they cease life. The body goes back to the dirt. You say, well, what happens to the soul? Well, the spirit goes back to God who gave it. What happens to the soul? The soul ceases to exist. All right? The soul ceases to exist according to the Bible. Going back to that illustration with like the box, you got the wood and the nails. Think of the box. The wood is like the body. The nails is the spirit. You put them together. You've got a box. You take them apart. What happened to the box? It ceases to exist. It does not go to box heaven. It ceases to exist. Now, notice question number eight and question number nine. Well, first, we're going to fill out question number eight. And you're welcome to take a picture of these if you'd like to, or you can um, write really fast. But notice question number eight. What do the following texts have to say about death? So in Psalms 115, the psalmist writes, the dead praise not the Lord. In Psalms chapter six, in death, there is no remembrance of thee. In Job chapter 7, he shall, re, he shall return no more to his house. Some people think, but I know Uncle, you know, uh, I, I don't want to use anybody's name in here. <laughs> um, I know um, Uncle Jim Bob. I don't think we have anybody named Jim Bob. I know Uncle Jim Bob died and he's come back and he's haunting the house. The Bible says he shall return no more to his what? House. The idea of the dead coming back. And I know Halloween's coming up. Ooh, right? The idea of the dead coming back and haunting a house, that is not biblical, all right? That's only in Hollywood movies and in scary stories. And by the way, demons, demons do not haunt houses, they haunt people. There's no examples of demons haunting two by fours and sheetrock, all right? <laughs> they attack people. So again, we've got to make sure we're not allowing Hollywood to dictate our biblical theology. We've got to be very careful about that. In Isaiah, it says, death cannot celebrate thee. And in Psalms 146, his thoughts perish. So question number nine, the above texts, question nine, the above texts all speak of death as the end of conscious thoughts. That's the, that's the answer to number nine, conscious thoughts. The Bible says his thoughts perish. Notice here in question number 10, what happens at death? Just a quick review. Now, Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon, the wisest man who have ever lived, according to Jesus. And Solomon says, Then shall the dust, that would be his body, returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit, that's the breath of life, shall return unto God who gave it. Now, I have done visits. I know Pastor Barry has also. I've done visits where I'm with the family when their loved one's about to, you know, expire. I was with my aunt, my Aunt Betty, a few years ago in Las Vegas when she passed away. I was the one sitting in the room, and my mom and my sister, they were in the other room, but I was the one sitting in there with my aunt, and I was timing, I was counting the, the, the seconds between each breath because I noticed they were growing more and more shallow. And if you've ever been in the room with somebody when they pass away, it's, it's well, it's, it's not a pleasant experience, but it's definitely an experience nonetheless. And, and I was watching my aunt and she would breathe very shallow. And after I was timing it, I was keeping track of it. Then all of a sudden she took a breath and then she went, oh. and that was it. And I understood from what the Bible says, the spirit left her. And that spirit is not the conscious part of my aunt. That spirit, according to the Bible, is simply the breath of life. It's that gift, that spark. Now, God certainly has her, you know, on file DNA or however God does it up there. God has the loved ones, the saved ones on file because he's coming back the second time to raise them up or to rapture them up. Notice question number 11. It says, what does David, or how does David refer to death? David says, consider and hear me, O Lord my God, lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. 
So the answer to question number 11 is he calls it a sleep. Sleep, the sleep of death. Notice what Daniel says. Daniel says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting contempt. In question number 12, what about Paul? How does he refer to death? Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. The Apostle Paul, if you were to interview him tonight and say, Paul, tell us about death. What would he say? He would say that it is a sleep. We shall not all sleep. Question number 13. How does the Bible refer to death in 17 books and more than 60 times? The Bible, believe it or not, this is shocking. The Bible refers to death as being a sleep. Over 60 times in the Bible, it refers to death as being a sleep. An unconscious, not dreaming state, but an unconscious sleep. Now, I did a study on this because I heard a preacher preach on this years ago, and, and it didn't sit well with me. Because what I'm sharing with you tonight was not how I was raised. I heard a preacher preach on it once, and I thought, man, this guy's nuts. And so I went to the Bible and I wanted to find out how many different resurrections are in the Bible. I discovered there's about 12 different resurrections. You got Elijah and Elisha raised folks. Peter did. Paul did. Jesus did. Of course, the greatest and most important resurrection is the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because Paul says, without it, our faith is futile. But if there was a runner up, I would say it has to be a guy named Lazarus. If you have your Bible, go with me to John chapter 11, if you'd be so kind. You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. In John chapter 11, the Bible tells us that Jesus was hanging out with his disciples and Jesus got word. John chapter 11, Jesus got word that his friend Lazarus was dead. Or I should say that he was sick. He was sick. Let me correct myself. He got word that Lazarus was sick. And instead of going right away to heal him, the Bible says Jesus hung out there for a few days. And so in John chapter 11, and I'm going to look at verse 11, the Bible says, These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleeps, he shall do well, because when you're sick, you want to get rest, right? Verse 13, how be it, Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So when Jesus says our friend Lazarus sleeping, I mean, he's, he's sleeping, sure. The disciples are like, oh, great, I'm glad he's getting rest. No, Jesus corrected them, said, no, 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 he's not just sleeping. Jesus said Lazarus is dead. And like a few days go by. So now Lazarus has been dead for four days. Check this out. Jesus goes to Bethany, the city of Bethany. That's the home of Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus. And as Jesus is going into Bethany, let's pick it up here in verse 20. He is met by Martha. And notice what Martha says in verse 20. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went out and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. In other words, man, if you'd only got here sooner, right? Where were you? Why didn't you come? We sent you a message. She's frustrated. In verse 22, but I know that even now, whatever or whatsoever that will ask of God, God will give it to thee. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall what? Rise again. Now notice what Martha says. Verse 24, you want to, if you, if, assuming you're using your own Bible, you want to make a mark. Verse 24, notice what Martha says. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again. What does she say? In the resurrection at the what? Last day. Martha understood what I'm sharing with you tonight, friends. She says, I know he's going to rise again in the resurrection. And when is the resurrection? Paul says the dead in Christ rise first and the living are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. In verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. In other words, she say, he says, hey, look, you're looking at the resurrection, Martha. I am he. And why could Jesus make such a, such a bold claim? Because we read later on in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus says, I am 
the resurrection. In other words, Jesus says, let me go back to that. He says, I have the keys of hell. That word hell there in the Greek is the word Hades, meaning the grave. Jesus says, I have the keys of the grave and of death. So she's looking at the very one that can raise her brother Lazarus from the dead. And that's exactly what Jesus does. Jesus makes his way to the tomb. And at first, when they see Jesus coming and Jesus says, hey, roll away the stone. You know what their response is? In fact, notice their response here in verse 39. Uh, John eleven thirty nine. 39. Jesus said, take ye away the stone and Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he what? He stinketh, right? That's the King James. He stinks, man. He's been dead four days. And Jesus said unto her, said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Now, verse 43, and when he had thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And verse 44 says, and he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, loose him and let him go. So picture this, Jesus is there. They move the stone, man, whoa, these stinks. The guy's been dead four days. Jesus looks into that tomb. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. Now, I heard a preacher once say, and I'm inclined to agree with him, that if Jesus had been loose with his words, if he wasn't careful, if Jesus did not say, Lazarus, come forth, let's say he looked in that tomb and he just said, come forth. What do you suppose would have happened? Every grave on the planet could have opened up because Jesus is the resurrection. He is in charge. This ought to give us hope. Think about this. When somebody dies, who's in charge of that person? Jesus. God. Yes. He's in charge of our loved ones. When a person dies, when my grandfather passed away, Jesus is in charge of my grandpa. And Jesus says to Lazarus, come forth. And the guy comes walking out, you know, like a mummy like this. And Jesus says, hey, take off his, you know, his napkin and, and uh, loose him. Let him go. You know, here's the incredible thing. I did a study once and there are 12 different resurrections in the Bible. Now, Lazarus was dead four days. He began to stink, kind of like roadkill, right? He began to stink. I looked at all 12 different resurrections in the Bible. Not what somebody experienced and they wrote a New York Times bestseller book about. All right. I mean, if you want to read fiction, there are books out there. And I can't explain everybody's situation or what happened or their experience, but I can simply share with you what the Bible teaches. And I think that's why you're here. Out of all 12 resurrections, think about this, in the Bible, not a single one of them mentioned anything that they saw or experienced. Not one of them. And why is that? Because the Bible says, this is question number 15, Question number 15, according to Ecclesiastes 9, 5, what do the dead know? The Bible says, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. And imagine this, hypothetically, I die. I'm dead four days. I'm down at the, at the morgue. After four days, the, the, the guy on watch hears a banging coming. That <laughs> probably scares him half to death, right? Opens up the thing and I'm alive. Four days I was dead. No hoax, no conspiracies, four days. Not I fell into an icy river and somehow the coldness preserved me and they brought me back after 20 minutes, four days. And I say, man, I've got a seminar. We got to finish this Bible seminar. I don't, and so I, I come right to this church. I say, man, we got to make up. We missed a few nights. Pastor Barry, let's invite the people. I'm back. Let's get this thing going again. If I was dead four days verified and I came to this church to present a seminar, this church would be packed and you would have CNN and Fox and MSNBC and the local news and all the different news stations. 
They would all have their vans in the parking lot. They would all come here and they would all put their microphone right in front of me and they would all have the same question. And what question is that? What did you see? What happened? But what did, what did, what did Lazarus say? I mean, think about it. Let's take, here, here, here's how you know if you have something correct. You take what the Bible teaches and we plug it into the common beliefs of today. All right? Now, this might step on a few toes. I don't mean to, but I'm just going to, I'm going to shoot straight with you. So let's take the story of Lazarus and let's plug it in. Lazarus dies. He goes straight to heaven. He's there in heaven for four days. He's walking the streets of gold like that guy said about my grandpa, right? He goes to the tree of life and he plucks off an avocado. Because that's what grows on the tree of life. I can't prove it from the Bible, but I'd like to think there's avocados there, right? And, 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 and right when he's about to take a bite from that giant avocado, poof, he's back, in the, he's back in the grave and he comes walking out like this. What do you think Lazarus would have said to Jesus? He wouldn't be happy. Are you kidding me? Man, you know what it was like up there. You came from there. Why would you do? Or imagine the other way. Imagine Lazarus is in hell for four days. And then Jesus brings him up from the burning place of hell. What do you think he would have said? But what does Lazarus say? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Now, I can't explain every nuance and every experience people have as far as like a near-death experience, all right? All I can share with you is what the Bible teaches. Now, I can tell you that a near-death experience is, in fact, the person did not die, and that's why they're called a near-death experience. They were very close to death, all right? Maybe the heart stopped beating, oxygen wasn't going to the brain. And so, so yeah, but, but, but they were able to bring them back, you know, just in, in the lick of time. Praise God for that. And I'm not trying to step on any toes because I hear stories all the time. People say, well, I had this experience. And someone else says, well, I had this experience. Can you tell me what it means? And I say, look, I, I'm not, that's not my, I, I'm just, I'm just sharing you what the Bible has to say. I just want to share what the Bible has to say. And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, Paul says, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise when? So here's the question I have for you. If when we die, we go straight to heaven, why does Jesus come back to raise the dead? Jesus comes back, the dead in Christ rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. The dead rise first, the living are caught up, they meet the Lord in the air. But notice what Paul adds on, verse 18. This is the verse that's often left off of this passage. But in verse 18, Paul says, Wherefore comfort one another with what? These words. So I know what I'm sharing tonight might step on a few toes, and I don't mean to do so. But the Apostle Paul, his counsel, after Paul says the dead in Christ rise first, the living are caught up to meet the Lord in the air, the very next thing he says is comfort one another with what? These words. Now, I realize that, you know, in, in like sports or, or when, when, when something incredible happens, you know, or something amazing takes place, it's, it's common for people to kind of say, hey, you know, they kind of, this is, this is for you, grandpa. You know, I like to play golf and, and so I, I get a, I get a nice shot, you know, I'm in the fairway or, or, you know, I'm putting for, for birdie or, or oh Lord, please, even for eagle. And, 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 you know, it's easy for people to say, Hey, you know, this is for you, grandpa. But, but if we're going to be consistent, let's think about that. Yeah. It's nice to think that our loved ones can look down upon us when something good happens. But what about when something bad happens? You see, my grandfather died when I was 18. My grandma, who was also, they were married over 50 years. They were both combined over 100 years ordained ministers in the Four Square Church, which is a, it's a charismatic church. My grandma lived another 13 years after my grandfather died. And during those 13 years, she developed breast cancer. And she had a double mastectomy. Very emotional for a woman to go through something like that. Very hard. And then when she was going to a, a follow-up visit, somebody 
a, a young thug knocked her over in the, ho in the hospital parking lot and punched her and, and took her purse. Big old welt, black and blue. And then, of course, I remember when my grandmother died, we were there. I mean, you're there, your family, you love them. And we were there in the room with her when she was about to expire. I mean, if my grandfather was looking down and he saw the love of his life dying of cancer, because it came back. If, if he saw her getting punched and assaulted, knocked to the ground, all alone, scared in a parking lot. I mean, would that really be heaven? You know, I remember thinking when I was even like in my 20s, I would think, you know, if, if they're looking down upon us, man, I hope they're not watching me like when I'm like, bathing or something you know i used to kind of like kind of weird me out see people often only use it when something good happens but it wouldn't be heaven because my grandfather would say hey god why are you allowing this to happen why don't you intervene don't you care aren't you fair right begin to doubt the character instead when the bible says a person dies that they sleep my grandfather closed his eyes he went to sleep my grandmother she closed her eyes and now think about it this way to the person who died whether it's been six thousand years six hundred years sixty years six minutes you understand the idea here to the person that died no matter how much time goes by to the person that died when they take that last breath and they close their eyes and, and they expire their next thought no matter how much time on this planet goes by to the person who died their very next thought in the moment in the twinkling of an eye their next thought guess who they see coming back jesus so to the person that died it's instant in that sense they're in the presence of god does that make sense yes or no so so they're not laying in the grave looking at a watch thinking man it's been it's already 2022 i mean obviously they wouldn't have a watch in the grave and no maybe they do i don't know but you know what i mean they're not thinking you know why is it taking so long no to the person that died their very next thought even though life drags on for the living to the one who died it's instant friends their next thought they see jesus coming back is that good news yes or no that cancer can't attack him anymore. That heart disease can't attack him. If they were struggling with a mental illness, whatever sin plagued them on this planet, it can no longer attack them because if they died in Christ, they are sleeping in Jesus, awaiting for Jesus to come back and not just say, Lazarus, come forth. But when Jesus comes back, he's going to bring all the redeemed with him, right? All the graves are going to open up and the living are caught up. Now, with all that said, I realize it's 6.57, so I'm going to go through some stuff in about, about three minutes-ish. It's a prophetic three minutes, all right? But there's a couple of questions I, I do want to answer. We're on the back page, but question number 16. What about the thief on the cross? So I want to look at a couple of passages in the Bible now, to be fair, that, that kind of seem to say something a little bit different all right because here's what happens on any subject in the bible i used to build fences anybody here ever built a fence lots of fences i'm sure and, and, and when you build a fence and, and you put your your posts in if the fence is straight and they're all lined up you should not not that this is the the best way to do it but but you should be able to get back and kind of squint your eye and if they're all lined up how many posts are you going to see you're going to see one. So, you know, you might have, you know, like a hundred verses or say 99 verses and they're all lined up. But what if there's one that seems to be kind of off a little bit? What you do is you dig up those 99 fence posts and you move them over to where that one is, right? And then you charge the customer, you know, overtime <laughs> if you're a contractor. No, no, you, you would move that one to get it back in line. Well, the same thing with the Bible. You may have a whole bunch of verses and they're all consistently saying one thing. And then you come across one or two. And this does happen in different topics in the Bible. You may come across one or two verses and they may seem to say something a little bit different. You never ignore the verses. Instead, you simply study them out 
and see how can they harmonize. Because the one thing I've learned about the Bible is when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to truth, truth will always stand up to scrutiny. You understand that? If you've got something true, it's going to be true from Genesis to Revelation. So what about the thief on the cross? Well, let's read about the thief. This is question number 16. In Luke 23, now this is the thief speaking. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into thy kingdom. So picture this. Jesus is hanging on the cross. I know for modesty reasons, they always have like a kind of a, like a, almost like a diaper. Not, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but some kind of cloth or diaper thing kind of, you know, I don't think the Romans were very concerned about modesty. I mean, there's a very good chance they were hanging on the cross in their birthday suit. All right. And so Jesus is hanging up there, bloodied, naked, beaten. He doesn't appear like he can save anybody, let alone himself. He doesn't look like a king. But what does this thief say? He looks at Jesus and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Did Jesus in that condition look like a Lord that had a kingdom? Yes or no. So this man's got all kinds of faith. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And, and the way it's been translated here is it's, it's easy to, to, to come to the idea that Jesus is saying to this thief, Today we're going to go to paradise together. Today you'll be with me in, in paradise. And the reason is, is simply because of where, now don't get too hung up on this, but I'm going to be shoot straight with you. It's because where that comma is located. Now the Bible is inspired by God. Paul, sa or Paul says that when he writes Timothy, all scripture is inspired. But what we have to understand is when it comes to like the chapters and the verses and even the punctuation, that was all added centuries later by the Bible translators. You see, when Luke wrote this book, Luke did not write Luke chapter 23, verse 42, and then think, you know, this is a good place to write verse 43. Does that make sense? Yes or no? He, he just wrote the book. Now, Luke wrote in Greek. The New Testament is translated from Greek. The Greek did not use punctuation. And so when the translators came in, translating it from the Greek into the English language, they had to add punctuation. And, and, and just so you know, punctuation, depending on where the punctuation is used, it can actually change the meaning of a sentence. And so the way this shows is, Verily I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. But, you know, the translator of this could have, in fact, some Bible translations actually do. They place the comma after the word today. Now, the King James translator places it before the word today. Other Bible translations will place it after the word today. And that comma placement changes the entire meaning. Because now you've got the thief saying, or I'm sorry, you have Jesus saying, Verily I say unto thee today, meaning I'm telling you today. You will be with me in paradise. Now, some of you are looking at me like you're watching a boring commercial on TV, but let me illustrate how this works. So same sentence, one has punctuation, one does not. How many grandmas we got in the audience tonight, right? Let's eat grandma. Or would you rather let's eat grandma? Does that comma change the meaning of the sentence grandmas? Yes or no? Yes, it does. Now, now, don't get too hung up on that, all right? But I, I just want you to, I'm going to shoot straight with you. And, and the Bible's 100% inspired, but the trans, I'm sorry, the punctuation was added later. So, so the number one under 16, you could write in there punctuation. Some translations have the comma before the word today. Others have it after the word today. Depending on the Bible translation, it will change the meaning of the response that Jesus is giving that thief. So want to make sure that's clear. But, but here's, here's some more interesting ones. Number one, or second one, did Jesus go to paradise that day? So on Sunday morning, I heard the right answer, but on Sunday morning, Jesus appears to the woman at the tomb and Jesus saith unto her, touch me not for I am not yet ascended to my what? Father. So how could he tell the thief on Friday 
today you're going to me today you're going with me to paradise and then tell the woman at the tomb on Sunday resurrection morning don't cling to me or don't touch me because I've not yet been to my father you see that you, you have a real issue there because you get Jesus saying one thing to one person and another thing to another person and then of course the questions asked did the thief die that day with Jesus now in John chapter 19 it describes how they took the bodies off the cross. And I want you to notice the difference here. The Jews, therefore, because it was their preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that, that, and that they might be taken away. They did not want bodies hanging on the cross on the Sabbath day. So they would take them down. But they would break their legs for a couple of the reasons. And I'll get into that. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and they saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. You see, Jesus was dead, and so they didn't break his legs, but they broke the legs of the thieves because they were still what? Alive. Very interesting there. All right? So make sure the three points are the punctuation, what Jesus says to the woman Sunday morning, I've not yet been to my father. And when Jesus came up the cross, he was dead, but the thief was still alive. Very important. So we can see, once again, things begin to harmonize. Now, question number 17 um, asks, what did Paul mean when he tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 6, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord? Now, this verse is often used like at funerals or uh, to give people hope. And it's often, it's often quoted, but sometimes kind of misquoted, where, where folks will say, you know, to be absent from the body is to be at home with Jesus. And it's used in the context to say, hey, your person died and we know where they are right now. But, but let's look and see exactly what Paul is saying in this Bible passage. So this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's notice what Paul is saying, but let's also notice what he isn't saying. All right? So, verse, uh, verse, or chapter 5. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Meaning when we're in this body right here, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing. Notice what he says there. He says, and willing, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You see, what happens is, it, it, we, we, we often, if, if we've got a certain like kind of theological belief, we'll often read a verse in the Bible, and, and I try to, and I can be guilty of this at two at times, but I try to protect myself, is I never want to make the Bible writer say something that they were not intending to say, simply because it fits with what I think they should be saying. You see, in this verse, Paul says that he's willing rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. He doesn't say this is actually the case. He says, I would rather, I'm willing, I would rather be out of this body. In other words, think about it. If you had the option, would you rather stay in your present body right now or would you rather be at home with Jesus? Yeah, other than I'd like to think people would miss me, <laughs> you know, I'd much rather be at home with Jesus. And so notice what Paul isn't saying. He never says when this takes place. Follow me. Paul does not say, as soon as we die, we are absent from the body and present with the Lord. That's not what Paul, that's how we read it to say, but that's not what Paul actually says. Paul also doesn't say, when Jesus comes back, then we're absent from the body and present with the Lord. The, the, the point Paul is making here, friends, is very simple. He's saying, look, while we're in this body, we're not at home with God. But I would be willing, I would rather be out of this earthly body, this corruptible temple, and I would much rather be home with Jesus. But he never says in this verse when that takes place. We have often just read into it, meaning when a person dies. But Paul knew exactly, notice, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says, for I am now ready. Now, this is when Paul says it happens. I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now, this is question number 18. 
Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord righteous judge shall give me when? At that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his what? Appearing. You see, Paul knew when he would get that crown of righteousness. And he says, not just to me, but to everyone that loves his appearing. When are all the righteous going to see the appearing of Christ? That would be at the second coming, right? Paul understood that we all go to heaven together. Now, again, I realize for many of us, this is a sensitive subject because, well, Death can be a sensitive subject. I've done funerals, I've counseled with families, and it, it, it grieves. I've lost aunts and uncles and grandparents. I, I lost a sibling. I've got another sibling who's got terminal brain cancer. And so it's, you know, and I imagine in your own situation, you probably have similar stories to share. And, you know, when the, when the Bible refers to death as being a sting, it really is a sting. Now, on question number 18, it talks about the rich man and Lazarus. What I'm going to do when you leave tonight, I'm going to give you a little book called The Rich Man and Lazarus. So I'm going to encourage you to go home tonight or tomorrow and this little book right here, but most importantly, make sure you've got this big book right here with it. And I want you on your own to answer question number 18. All right, so I'm going to give you a little homework assignment. I want you to answer question number 18. You can read this little book and you can take a look at the big book, the Bible. Now, this subject tonight, here's my closing thought I want to leave you with. Tonight's subject is a subject from a God who loves you. All right, tonight's subject is not to offend anybody. My goal tonight is not to step on anybody's toes or anything like that. My goal tonight in presenting this subject is, 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 is God's way of trying to protect us. Of doing what, everybody? To protect us. And here's why. The very first lie in the Bible dealt with what subject? Death. What did the devil say to Eve? He said, you shall not what? And in the last days, the devil is going to do miracles because he wants to deceive the entire world. And Jesus said, if it were possible, he would deceive the very elect. Now, here's what I want you to think about. You look at every world religion, every major world religion, even the vast majority of Christianity. Right now, the stage is being set. Because virtually every religion around the world has one thing in common. Whether it's Hinduism, Buddhism, all right? Whether it's Islam or, or, or even Christianity, every world religion, for the most part, they all have this one thing in common, this one belief they all agree upon. They may call it different things, but they're all in agreement that when you die, you don't really die. Think about it. You think about Hinduism, and they teach reincarnation, right? You don't really die, you're reincarnated. Islam, you know, you enter into paradise, right? Where there's a whole bunch of virgins. Buddhism, you don't really die, it's, 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 it's nirvana, and that's not the rock band from Seattle, but, but you go to a place called nirvana, right? You got new age. They teach you don't really die, you become your own god, and then, of course, you've got Christianity. They teach you don't really die. You either go straight to heaven or you go straight to hell. But the vast majority of all the religions around the world all have this one belief in common. When you die, you don't really die. And what was the very first lie the devil spoke to Eve? God said, if you eat of that tree, you're going to what? And what did the devil say? You're not really going to die. And the devil is setting the stage as we speak. And I told you, you watch some of the movies out there and TV shows and even kids cartoons. He is setting the stage for the greatest deception. I mean, can you imagine if, 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 some, if somebody as like godly as, as Mary, the mother of Jesus, what if she were to appear back from the dead? 
claiming stuff. You know what? Supposedly, she's already done that. And people flock to her. But imagine if it was like, say, the Buddha or Muhammad or a famous religious leader like John Paul II or somebody else. I'm not trying to pick on any particular religion, but a religion. But imagine if, if something like that were to happen and they were to appear over a major city in the sky with a message from God. And it's not some conspiracy garbage. This is like, this is real. This is happening. This news, the message that they would have would circle the entire planet, not in months, weeks, or days, but it would go viral in a matter of hours. You see, the devil is setting the stage because he wants to deceive the entire world. And a correct understanding of tonight's presentation, as hard as it might be to digest. And I tell you, sometimes we have to disabuse our minds because I understand that if you've been thinking something for 60 years, it's hard in a 60 minute presentation to kind of to, to undo all that. So, so I realize there's some juggling around going on. I accept that. I believe that. And I'm, I'm gracious for that. But my prayer tonight, friends, is that you would look to the Bible and that you would look to Jesus. So the question I want to ask you tonight is this. Number one, was this clear? Was it from the Bible? Absolutely. And the final question at the very bottom of the lesson guide, it says, God has a solution to the problem of death. And that solution is the second coming of Jesus and the great resurrection are you thankful for the Bible which tells us the truth of this sensitive subject of death? You see, I'm looking forward to the day when Jesus comes back. My grandparents, they're buried right next to each other down in a little grave in Hemet, California. And one of these days when Jesus comes back, my grandpa, my grandma love the Lord with all their hearts. They have no idea, at least my grandpa, I'm looking forward to seeing him again. I was 18 when he died. All he knew of me is I was a high school dropout that liked to smoke pot and get drunk on the weekends. My grandpa has no idea that I became a minister, just like him. I'm looking forward to the day when he, I get to see him face to face and say, Grandpa, you'll never believe. Remember those prayers you used to say to me, Grandpa? You'll never believe. God got through. Change his hearts. And grandpa's going to come up and, and grandma's going to come up. And boy, grandpa, wait till you see grandma with that hot body, right? Let's be honest. It's going to be a brand new glorified body. Grandma's going to be looking good for grandpa. And the other way around, right? Grandpa's going to look good too. Jesus is going to say, welcome home. And that's not just for my grandparents. That's for all of those. Even your family. Even the ones that we care about that love Jesus. That's why this is so important, friends. To not only have a correct understanding, but we have to be ready to. Because there's nothing that we want more than to see each and every one of us ready when Jesus comes back. Hey, tomorrow night at 6 p.m., Revelations Lake of Fire. And then uh, Friday we're off. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. But Friday, Revelations Bottomless Pit. And the next weekend, we've got a double header. We've got, of course, one on Sunday. And so let me tell you, it just keeps getting better. When you leave tonight, make sure you grab a, a little booklet here. It'll help you answer question number 19. So you got a homework assignment. And we'll see you tomorrow night. Let's have a closing prayer. Father in heaven, as we bow our heads tonight, Lord, I realize that when I first heard this sensitive subject, it, it kind of rattled my cage a little bit. But my prayer is that each and every one of us, that we would look to the Bible. Not to a preacher, not to a church, not to somebody on TV, or even, even to this bald gap on the platform here. But we would look to the Bible. And we would ask the question, what does the Bible have to say? And if what we discover is truth in the Bible, I pray, Lord, that you would then give us the conviction that we would have the, 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 the boldness to want to stand upon it and accept it and believe it and to move forward with it. And so, Father, I pray that you would just continue that good work that you started in us. Watch over us, protect us, give us traveling mercies. 
and bring us back here again tomorrow night. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, God bless you guys. We love you. Have a wonderful night, and we'll see you tomorrow. God bless you.